All right, folks. So I mentioned beginning of uh, lecture, um, depending on how far we got on uh, on the planned lecture, I might need a um, little bit of a introduction. Um, and a lot of this is likely to be somewhat review from other science classes you've probably had in the past. Um, that said, there is no science prereq for this class, so I'm going to teach it as though you've never heard of a proton before. Um, so it'll be a good, a good option for, or a good review. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the history and some of that, the logic that went into deciding this stuff, but we'll save most of that for lecture on, on uh, Wednesday. Um, but the basis of all of this, and the basis of this, this lab, um, is that it starts with that that uh, definition that really a thought experiment um, that was a debate between Democritus and Aristotle back in the I think about 2000 BC, um, where if we start cutting a piece of copper wire, if we start with a piece of copper wire and we just keep cutting it in half, and then we take each half and we cut it in half again and keep going, keep cutting it in half and half and half, eventually one of two things has to happen. Um, either we'll get to a point where we can't divide the copper up anymore, where we can't cut it in half again, or we'll go until the copper is infinitely small, meaning that there's not really a limit. We can, can keep, keep cutting things in half indefinitely, and there's no limit to how small we could, we could get. Um, and so that was the attitude that was, or the, the view that was held by Aristotle, um, who won out in court of popular opinion and just by living longer. Um, Democritus took the approach that matter is made up of small individual particles that he called atoms, which means literally indivisible. Um, and Democritus's famous um, quote about this is that nothing exists but atoms in empty space, all else is opinion. Um, which is a good, a good bumper sticker, maybe, or a good, uh, good comeback for Aristotle, but um, wasn't actually anything that they could test. So it it took until we got to the 1700s, 16, 1700s, before you started getting scientists that actually came up with some really clever ways of testing this. Um, and one of the biggest things was that. Um, the uh, the guy who invented statistics, uh, an Arabic mathematician, also was was responsible for formulating some of the um, scientific method. Um, back when it was Democritus versus Aristotle, they didn't know understand the scientific method. Best that they could do is they just treated everything as though it was philosophy, and they just did it all through logic proofs. Um, they didn't actually test any of their theories um, because they, you know, the idea of the scientific method had not been, then maybe it was floating around in some of their heads, but it hadn't been formulated in, or formalized, that's the word I'm looking for, um, into like a, a, an actual process. So when we get into the 16, 1700s, Lavoisier, Proust, and Dalton came up with these, these laws. And remember, laws just means that, um, that they described what happens, not why it happens. So these three laws that we'll talk about in more detail on Wednesday, um, basically could be put together um, to come up with what's called atomic theory. Right? And so Dalton was the one who put, put the final pieces together. Um, and uh, Dalton's atomic theory had these three postulates to it. Uh, each element is made of tiny indestructible particles called atoms. All atoms of a given element have the same mass and other properties that distinguish them from other elements. Uh, atoms can combine in, in whole number ratios to form compounds. In other words, simple whole number ratios. That means basically you can't have half an atom, is what he's saying there. And atoms cannot change from one element to another. They can only change how they're attached to other atoms. So a lot of this had to be revised, but that's kind of how science works. This was a good starting point for atomic theory. And then um, each of these pieces has been picked apart and had, had caveats added to it um, over, over the past centuries. 
Um, for instance, atoms aren't indestructible. You can take an atom, you, you, everybody's heard the phrase split the atom, right? Um, well, so that tells us that they're not truly indestructible, um, but it doesn't mean we throw this out because it just means you can't split them any further without changing what they are. If you got an individual copper atom, just like Democritus and Aristotle were discussing, and you cut that copper atom in half, it's no longer copper at that point. So you can add these caveats on there. Um, and uh, number two changes, because it turns out different atoms can have slightly different masses from each other and still be the same element, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and atoms can change from one element to another. If um, you split those atoms, you actually are going to switch from being um, one type of element to two smaller atoms um, that are going to be a different type of element. So this was a good starting point. Um, we'll skip over some of the logic or some of the, the experimental evidence here for now. Um, and what it, basically we wound up with these, this is the next version, the next iteration of atomic theory was what they called nuclear theory. A nuclear theory took the atomic theory and took it one step further and said, okay, well, almost all of the atom's mass is in a chunk we're gonna call the nucleus in the middle. Um, and this is actually named after a, at this point they could see, they had microscopes strong enough to see the nucleus in a cell. Um, and so nucleus and atomic nucleus, I believe is named after um, the nucleus in a cell because it kind of looks similar. Instead of having one section in the middle of a cell that's full of DNA for atoms, we have one section in the middle of the atom that has all the mass, mostly all the mass anyway. And it also has positive charge. There's a, the nucleus of all of these atoms they discovered has a positive charge to it. And we, so the way that, and they found that that charge varied by a set amount. You could have a plus one charge or a plus two charge or a plus three charge, but you couldn't have a plus two and a half charge. So that led to the idea that the nucleus was made up of a discrete number of, and discrete means a whole number, uh, means no, no decimals, only integers. Um, a nucleus is made up of a discrete number of protons, and each of the protons have the positive charge. And then the negative charge is in this area around the nucleus, and it's carried by particles called electrons. So the electrons are negative, protons are positive. All right, so continuing to get, just give some vocab here. Um, the number of protons is what they eventually settle on as being the deciding factor as to different elements. Um, so in other words, different elements, are defined by the number of protons. The number of protons is what makes one atom a specific element. That is the definition of an element is, um, so the definition of sodium, for instance, is it's an atom that has 11 protons. All right, so Atomic number and atomic symbol and element name are all different ways of talking about the same thing. Sodium is the name of the element. The atomic symbol for sodium is Na. The atomic number for sodium is 11. Every sodium atom is going to have those same three properties. Those are kind of interchangeable qualities. Atomic number to atomic symbol is always gonna be the same. There's nothing that can change it. If you've got 11 protons, by definition, it's sodium. And if you, but if you change the number of protons in the nucleus somehow, it's no longer sodium. Right? And so we'll talk about why the periodic table has the structure that it, and the shape that it does when we start talking about electrons in more detail. Um, but for this lab, what we need to know most is what are the, the three subatomic particles that make up atoms. And the most important one that makes up elements is the protons. 
but if we have, if atoms are neutral and protons are positive, that means you have to have something negative as well. In other words, if it's an atom that's neutral, you have to have just as many electrons as protons. If you have a net charge, meaning that you have a mismatch in the number of protons and electrons, it's called an ion. And an ion is just any time you've got either more protons than electrons or more electrons than protons. Um, an ion is any time you have a net charge. If you have extra electrons, that means you're going to have a negative charge because all the electrons are negative. If you have a positive charge, that means you have extra protons compared to the electrons. So if you know the atomic number or the atomic symbol, you know how many protons you have. If you know how many protons you have and you know the charge, you know how many electrons you have, indirectly at least. And then lastly, they figured out as they were starting to look at the periodic table and, and figure out what the shape of the periodic table should be, that hydrogen was known to be the smallest element. It had a charge of one, of one. It had only one proton in the nucleus. And helium was the next smallest. It had two protons. However, helium was not twice as heavy as hydrogen. It was four times as heavy. And so they had something else taking up mass. So the extra mass is made up of the last subatomic particle called a neutron. And so we can kind of look at, we can kind of uh, summarize this um, in a table. I'm going to stop sharing and do this on the whiteboard here. And so protons, electrons, and neutrons are the pieces we have to work with. And you can think of them a little bit like, like Legos. By putting together these three pieces, you make every type of atom on the, on the periodic table. You just have to have them in the right ratios, right? So if we look at what their properties are, so first off, they all have a, their own abbreviation, which is kind of uh, helpful because you don't want to write out proton every single time. Um, if it's a lowercase p with a plus sign, that's the shorthand for a proton. A lowercase e with a negative charge is an electron. And a lowercase n with a superscript zero, indicating a charge of zero, is a symbol for a neutron. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, and the, their key properties that we're looking at is for each of them are going to be mass and charge. So they're all going to have their own properties that are going to be a function of do they have mass and do they have charge electrons technically have mass but they're so small based on or relative to protons and neutrons we can effectively say that electrons have no mass protons and neutrons are mo both much bigger So protons and neutrons both have mass, electrons don't. I'm actually gonna erase this for a second because I guess there are three variables. Where are they? Do they have mass and what's the charge? So protons and neutrons both have mass and they're both in the nucleus. Electrons don't have mass, and they exist in that sort of cloud uh, around the nucleus. So I'm just going to write the cloud. They surround the nucleus, but they're not 
part of the nucleus. And the last part is the charge for each of them. Protons have a plus one charge. Electrons have a negative one charge. And neutrons are neutral, hence the name. Right, so by combining these three pieces in the right ratios, we can we can describe every type of matter that we that there is. Every atom is made up of some combination of these three pieces. All right, and this actually gets into the theoretical physics a little bit. Um, mass is the one variable that, or the one force, gravity is the one force that they can't bring into a unified theory of everything. Um, nuclear forces that hold the nucleus together, electromagnetic forces, those can all be reconciled. They, they're all tied together um, and they're, they all kind of work together. And so, but mass is a separate force. Gravity is a separate force, which is why basically this gets its own category here. If we understood how gravity worked at the quantum level, we'd be able to probably combine all this into one category, into one variable here um, to describe these. But that's for the theoretical physicists to worry about, not for us. For this class, this is what we need to know for at least for this lab. And then we're going to expand on electrons. Because remember that one of those postulates of the atomic theory was that you can't change what's in the nucleus. For the most part, the nucleus of an atom stays the same. But electrons we can change because they're not part of the nucleus. So where we're headed from here is, OK, well, protons and neutrons don't really change. But by changing the electrons we have, we can make things more stable or less stable. We can give things a charge. We can make them react with other elements, with other compounds. That's all going to be based on electrons moving around because protons and neutrons are, for the most part, fixed. I think that that's the bulk of what you need for this assignment. Let me double check. So this assignment has you doing things where basically it gives you a little bit of history about atomic theory. Um, and then it, it has you start to vary some of these things. It actually had, you can actually pick up at protons and neutrons in the simulation and stick them together to make a nucleus. And, and so you're gonna be trying to do that to make a nucleus that has the properties that they tell you they want it to have it you know, give it this atomic number with this many, with this much mass. Um, and actually, I guess that's one thing I can add here is instead of just yes or no, we usually talk about mass for these. It's neutrons and protons are really close to the same mass. And so we basically can just say that they're, they have one AMU, which stands for atomic mass unit. It basically just means it, if you have 10 protons and 11 neutrons, your total mass is going to be 21. You can just add up your protons and neutrons to get your mass number. And electrons are so small that we basically just say that they have no mass. All right, and so the one last piece of advice I'll give you, so you've heard it from me before you hear it in the simulation, is that if you change the number of protons, well, protons are what define what type of element we have, right? So changing protons means that you changed elements. If you go from six protons to seven protons, that's a whole different element now. You just went from carbon to nitrogen. 
if you change the number of electrons, you're changing what ion you have. You're changing the charge. Neutrons, changing the number of neutrons does not affect the charge because neutrons are neutral. And it doesn't change what element it is because that's defined by protons. So if you change the number of neutrons, you're changing isotopes. And so a, an isotope just means you're talking about a specific nucleus that has a specific mass number. And so if, if you change the number of neutrons, you change what isotope you have, but you might not change what the element is. Right, so the most common isotope of carbon, for instance, has a mass number of 12. Six of those mass units are protons, the other six are neutrons. If you add an extra neutron on there, it's still carbon, but you change it from being carbon 12 to carbon 13. So anytime you hear an element name with a number following it, they're telling you what a specific isotope is that you're talking about. Carbon 14 is the carbon that they use for dating living um, or formerly living um, materials. Uh, uranium-235 is the isotope that they use in, and I always mix this one up, I think 235 is the isotope they use in power plants. And I think uranium-238 is the one they use in bombs. Sorry, Sean, could you just repeat, you said an element with a number on it is what? Could you call it if, what? If you, if you say an element name followed by a number, mm -hmm. that's telling you a specific, that's telling you a lot of information about that nucleus right so it means if you say carbon 12 the fact that it's carbon tells us that it has six protons and 12 is the mass number meaning that sum of neutrons and protons So 12 is telling us protons plus neutrons equals 12. Right, so element name tells you how many protons you have. The mass number tells you protons plus neutrons. So you can work out how many neutrons you have based on that, right? You have to do a little subtraction. But if I had carbon 14, it's still carbon, so it's still six protons. But that just, the 14 is telling us the protons plus the neutrons adds up to 14. So carbon 14 has still has six protons, but now it has eight neutrons. Right, and so, that's the term isotope just means that we're being very specific about both what the element is and how many neutrons it has. So carbon always has six protons? Carbon always has six protons by definition. If it has a different number of protons, it's not carbon anymore. Not carbon. Got it. Exactly. But you can change the neutrons without changing the charge. And so it's still the same element, it's just a different isotope, right? So changing protons changes your element, changing the number of electrons changes the ion or changes the charge, changing the number of neutrons changes your isotope. And again, you guys are hearing this for the first time in lab today. We'll um, the other group will hear it first in lecture, and you will be hearing it again in lecture. So you'll be able to review all of this in lecture on Wednesday as well. And I'll add some more detail to some of the, the theory and some of the experiments they, that they did, because it's actually kind of 
uh, at least to me. Um, it's really cool to me because they, they had to find a way back in the 1700s that they could actually measure things that were far too small to be seen even with a microscope. So they had to get very creative with how they designed their experiments to try and prove or disprove these various theories. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what that actually looked like and how they, how they actually reached these conclusions. Um, the lobster simulation goes the other direction, goes sci-fi with it, puts you down on another planet and says, look at the different materials. What are they based on the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons? All right, so you get some practice. And then homework this week is going to be light on calculations and lots of practice with this, filling out tables where I say, OK, this isotope with this charge, how many protons, neutrons, electrons? All right, so get comfortable with these concepts. Those three subatomic particles are going to define everything we do this week for the rest of this week. All right? So I believe that's everything you need. Probably some of that was review, but if not, don't worry about it. And we'll go over any questions you have right now or on Wednesday, either way. And I will stop recording.